Okay, so it is my uh, great pleasure to welcome everyone to the policy panel uh, for this conference. Uh, first, I must say that I thought the, the conference was, was really fantastic, and uh, I hope that the panel will live up to the same standards as <laughs> the rest of the presentations. I'm sure it will, uh, given uh, the very distinguished panelists we have. Um, the theme for the panel uh, is uh, the global new norm, fragmentation, tensions, and, and uncertainty. So it goes a little bit beyond uh, just the broader theme of the of the conference on uh, uh, monetary and, and and fiscal policy, and I think there is a sense in which some of the challenges that are in front of us um, are medium to long term challenges. Whether we're thinking about new types of shocks, uh, new types of transitions that we have to address, um, geopolitical risks that are rising, um, or domestic uh, domestic shocks that are also important. Um, and, and I think it's, it's great to, uh, to recognize these uh, challenges and to think about how to address them. Um, of course, at the fund, this is something that we, we are looking at. We're, we've done a lot of work, for instance, on, uh, on geoeconomic fragmentation in the last two years. That's one of the, it's been one of the big themes for us, trying to understand uh, the potential costs of, uh, 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 of decoupling between different, different blocks of countries. Uh, and, uh, and, and that's something that has also been one of the, one of the themes in, in the conference and some of the papers presented yesterday. Um, now, uh, these new shocks, this new norm will also force us to think about how we need to adjust our, our toolkits, uh, how, what implications are for, for monetary policy, for fiscal policy, maybe for other types of, uh, of policies, and I think this is where uh, some of the some of the discussion should be uh, from the policymaking uh, perspective. Uh, how to navigate uh, these, uh, this new environment? Uh, how to think about ways in which we can maybe uh, uh, reduce some of the some of these risks going forward, and and in doing so maybe reduce some of the some of the challenges uh, as well. So uh, let me uh, uh, let me turn it over to the three panelists. We have uh, we have a very distinguished panel today. Uh, in alphabetical order, we first have Olivier Blanchard, a senior fellow at the Peterson Institute for International Economics, has been in uh, uh, the position I'm in now, chief economist of the IMF from 2008 to 2015. Uh, Olivier was also the uh, Robert Solo Professor of Economics at MIT. Um, and his work spans, of course, every relevant topic in uh, macroeconomics that you can think of, whether it's monetary policy, fiscal policy, labor markets, uh, structural reforms. And so I think it's, uh, it's great to have him here. Most recently, he's been doing some very influential work together with Ben Bernanke on uh, the drivers of the inflation surge that we have witnessed in the last, uh, in the last three years. Um, then uh, we will hear from uh, Philip Lane, who is currently serving as a member of the uh, executive board of the European Central Bank, as everyone here knows. He uh, was previously governor of the Central Bank of Ireland from 2015 to 2019. And of course, before that, uh, Phil had a very distinguished uh, career also as an academic, as one of the foremost specialists on uh, issues of financial globalization microeconomics of exchange rate and capital flows, um, and certainly one of the leading voice uh, in thinking about some of these issues uh, to this day. And then uh, we'll hear from uh, Monica Piazzezzi, who's the John Kenny Professor of Economics at Stanford University, um, and a senior fellow at the Stanford Institute for Economic Policy Research. Uh, for many, many years, she was running the uh, NBR asset pricing program uh, one of a very successful uh, program at the NBR. And uh, Monica's work primarily focuses on macroeconomics, finance, and the complexities of financial markets and their connection with economic policies. And so I think between all three of them, we will cover a great range of topics. And I will ask them to come and, and, and maybe give some opening remarks for um, seven to 10 minutes. And I'd like to kick things off with a fairly broad question, but that goes to the core of what we, I want to discuss today, which is what do you see as the most significant economic challenges 
and opportunities for policymakers in his uh, global new norm. So let's start with Olivier. Good. Thank you, Pierre Olivier. Um, the, um, you, you asked a broad question. My first step will be to narrow it uh, so that I can uh, focus on some things. So I'm going to talk about what I see as the most significant economic challenges for economic stabilization policy, which is only part of what we need to do in advanced economies. I'm not going to talk about emerging markets, and I'm going to focus, because we are here at the ECB, on, uh, largely on monetary policy. And then the horizon is also relevant. I'm thinking of the, the next uh, 10 to 20 years or something like that. So given that, I thought about the right list. I concluded that I would choose two. The first one is the rise of populism and the macro implications of it and the policy implications of it. And the other is the population decline, which is going to be very striking uh, in a number of countries. Now, in doing so, I've left out, I think, the third, which is increased uncertainty about the future, given AI and given the green transformation, which I think forces policy to be very flexible depending on what happens. Okay, so let me start with the rise, the rise of, of populists or populism. Now, there's the first issue, which is, who are we? If we are a populist, then we probably give different answers uh, to what's, what's happening and, and how you should deal with it. But I'm going to assume that we would, we're all uh, good uh, old uh, social democrats, and that's how we look at things. Uh, and I let the populists design their own uh, policies, uh, if they can. So first point, I, I think it's, it's coming and it's going to get worse. Uh, I think that populism is largely feeding on anti-immigration. And I think global warming implies that there is going to be a whole lot more potential immigration. I mean, the numbers about the number of people in sub-Sahara uh, Africa, who will have to leave is between 40 and 100 million, and that they are likely to come largely to Europe, uh, and that's going to create enormous tensions. Uh, now, the question is, what is populism? And we use the word, but in fact, it comes in different shapes, and it has, again, macro implications. I'm not doing uh, political science here. Uh, it's basically us against them. And the, but the them is different. And I come from a country in which the them can be the immigrants on one side, and that leads to the extreme right, or it, it is the rich on the other side, and it leads to the nouveau front populaire, the extreme left. Uh, and again, this has very dramatic uh, different implications. I'm going to take two issues there. The first one is fiscal dominance. The other is protectionism. Now, traditionally, populism in Latin America, which is where uh, there is the most examples, uh, is very much fiscal irresponsibility, uh, leading to a crisis, leading to high inflation, and so on. I think it may be a bit different this time, to the extent that it's more focused on societal issues, on anti-immigrants. Uh, it may be that they actually don't need to be incredibly generous in fiscal terms. And if we look at populism in Italy or in Hungary, uh, then we don't see uh, fiscal irresponsibility in the primary deficits of these countries are smaller than the EU average. And if we look at Argentina, which is some kind of, Argent of populist regime, then clearly uh, the mode is not, uh, is, is not uh, fiscal, uh, uh, fiscal irresponsibility, but just the opposite. But it still leads to the issue of, of, of fiscal dominance. Now, there is an extreme form of fiscal dominance, which is the state of a government forcing the central bank to just buy the bonds at an interest rate, which it has decided. I don't think we're going to see this, at least not on a major scale. Uh, but it can take different forms. And the one I think we have to be worried about is if a government is fiscally responsible, uh, and that leads to a spread on sovereign bonds, what should be uh, the attitude of a central bank? Um, should it basically decrease the base rate 
in order to limit the increase in the interest rate, or should it try to punish uh, the government for misbehaving? And I think that's an issue that uh, may have to be considered uh, by central banks in a number of countries. The other issue is, uh, which is related is central bank independence. Uh, and the likelihood of decreased independence, which is being discussed uh, in the U.S. Here, it's much harder, uh, given that uh, there are 20 members. Uh, I, would, I would make two remarks here. The first one is, I think that monetary policy has to pay much more attention to the distribution effects of monetary policy. Um, if you're going to have a policy which affects mostly uh, the poor, or mostly some category of people, uh, then you may want to think again about using a different tool. And I think that's very relevant. Uh, and then the other, which goes the other way, is I think the central bank should avoid getting into issues which are not directly in their mandate, because they will expose themselves uh, to political risk. I'm thinking here of, uh, uh, of global warming and so on. I think that there's a risk there that they get involved into discussions which threatened independence. On protectionism, so it seems to me again, that's coming, that's coming for sure. I have used the expression, uh, a perfect storm. It seems to me that there are all kinds of reasons why we're going to see protectionism and increased emphasis on distribution effects, the uh, emphasis on economic security, the emphasis on, 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 on national uh, security, the emphasis on industrial policy with in mind uh, protectionism behind the scene. Uh, but I think all this is coming. Uh, I, I think here we first have to realize that behind all these forces, there is some good arguments and some bad arguments. So going beyond stabilization policies, we actually have to rethink how we stand on these various issues and when tariffs are justified and not. But to limit myself to uh, stabilization policy, uh, implications for monetary policy. Now, again, I'm going to stay short of actual wars, which raise all kinds of issues, which uh, we'll have to think about if we get there. But just in terms of tariffs and disruptions coming from the failure of supply chains uh, that we discussed uh, this morning, I think this is going to raise serious issues for central banks, which is it's going to look like a set of adverse supply shocks coming one after the other, maybe not of a magnitude that we just got, but keep keeping coming. And the issue there is can the central bank see through the shocks and just let them happen and then go back. But if the sequence of shocks is very long and very sustained, then at some point there'll be issues of credibility. So how to react to sequences of adverse supply shocks, I think is going to be an issue. So far, so good. The central banks really have kept credibility, but the episode was relatively short in, 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 in mind of, uh, of what I have in mind. So I think there, uh, that's something we have to think about. Let me briefly turn to the second topic, which is population decline. Here, I think it's very important to distinguish between the two sources of it. One, one is increased uh, life expectancy, which has played a big role, will play less of a role as we get to uh, physical limits, uh, but it's still going to be there. And the other is the dramatic decrease in fertility rates. And these are clearly two different aspects of the problem. They both have the implication that they lead to aging. The first one because people live longer and the second one because they are less young people. But in terms of growth, they have opposite effect, right? The first one, if it leads to some increase uh, in, uh, in uh, working age population, leads to an increase in growth, uh, the other one goes the other way. So we have to think about the implications. Uh, some of the numbers are very scary. Uh, I mean, I, for example, the decrease in population between today and 2050 is 10% decrease in population in Japan and South Korea, 20% in Bulgaria. These are numbers we haven't seen, and they have major implications. Uh, 
in terms of, again, going beyond economic stabilization, uh, it seems to be that uh, there are some policy responses, but the main one is, again, immigration. Korea may well have to uh, think hard about it, and others as well. On the macro, the more macro side, uh, this clearly has uh, major implications. I mean, the, the arithmetic one is the decrease in growth, even if uh, productivity growth remains the same. But there's also something fuzzier, but probably important, about the fact that aging societies tend to have lower uh, TFP growth. Uh, young people are the source of progress, uh, and that seems important. I want to focus on one particular aspect which strikes me as very important, which is what has happened in Japan and whether we're going to basically see Japan all over the place, gentrification, I think it's called. Uh, the crucial issue there is investment and saving. So it's clear that lower growth, population growth, leads to less investment. That's the usual effect. What it does to saving is slightly less obvious. Longer uh, life expectancy if it's not matched by a proportional increase in 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 in, in working uh, uh, in working age leads to more saving because you need to save more in order to have enough for your longer retirement you tend to think fertility rates go the other way which is there are less young people uh, saving so this would decrease saving relatively uh, but i think the effect is totally dominated by the fact that pay-as-you-go systems, which are the rule, are going to be less and less attractive. And so you're going to see, I think, more and more retirement by capitalization, either by the state or by people themselves, which leads to more saving. So I think the assumption that investment will decrease and saving will increase at a given interest rate is, is the right assumption. But we have to think more about it, but I think that's the way it goes. Now, if this is the case, then we know what happens is that the equilibrium rate rate decreases and then we get Japan. Then we get the potential ZLB, we get large deficits. And the question is, is this catastrophic? Is this manageable? Is it going to happen uh, in many countries? And I think in the case of Japan, we don't know. Uh, so far, so good, but clearly the level of debt is extremely high. Uh, and if my assumption about the interest rate is not correct, it might have fairly serious implications. But I think that's something we have to think about very hard for a return to the ZLB, for a need for large deficits, or apparently uh, uh, for a solution like this. And that's, I think, coming to uh, a neighborhood uh, next to you very, uh, very soon. So let me stop here, give the floor to Monica, maybe. Hopefully. We'll go to Phil first. Thank you, Olivier. Alphabetical order. Hey, uh, good afternoon. And um, just picking up on, on one of Olivier's uh, comments there about uh, population and immigration. So if you haven't seen it, Martin Wolf this morning has a very uh, interesting piece about uh, immigration policies as, as something that, of course, uh, uh, will will be part of, of the uh, future no matter what. So let me take a central bank perspective uh, on this. Uh, and uh, let, let me say, in a world of uh, more uncertainty, um, fundamentally, and I think if you were to kind of uh, summarize, I think uh, definitely for the ECB, but I'm sure it's more general, uh, that basically the role of central banks is under all scenarios to be a source of uh, stability. Uh, part of that is in relation to the financial system. And, you know, of course, uh, we, uh, a lot of my time spent on monetary policy, but central bank also has a role in terms of uh, macroprudential policy and through the supervisory side in terms of uh, supervising the European banking system. And uh, essentially the, the recipe, uh, I think it's, it's clear and has been clear that you want a banking system that, that has higher capital ratios, higher liquidity positions, and where basically the supervisors encourage uh, the banks to, to be uh, very good at risk assessment. So, so that, that's a, a basic backdrop. And I, I think uh, 
even in relation to the pandemic uh, and connected issues, uh, if we had encountered that with the European banking system we had, say, in 2007, compared to the European banking system we had in 2020, it would have looked different. This also connects to, to monetary policy. Um, and again, the fundamental promise we make, which is in the medium term, inflation will settle at 2%. That does not mean uh, if a shock arrives that inflation will always be at 2%. That's not the promise. But the promise is uh, if, if there is a significant uh, persistent deviation, there will be a response to make sure inflation comes back to 2%. And you might say, of course, that's obvious. You hear that all the time, and it goes without saying. I think it actually goes with saying. Uh, because um, th there are definitely, and Olivier mentioned one issue there, which is in relation to central bank independence, and there's definitely people, uh, I know at the Brookings panel there a few weeks ago, there's a paper, which actually I think is going to be presented here at ECB as, as well in the autumn uh, by Ken Rogoff and some others, which is basically a longer term perspective on in what, what, you know, what does it mean uh, to basically undermine uh, central bank's commitment to, to that kind of uh, stability. Okay, so I will say there's some kind of pretty fundamental characteristics there, uh, which I think uh, is very important in terms of uh, providing a very important anchor. So the world of uncertainty, many people say, okay, how do I navigate this world? How do I think about it? And if you had to think about, okay, what is going to be the medium term anchor for, for inflation, uh, that's an unhelpful, unnecessary extra dimension, dimension of uncertainty. And that, that essentially does mean we, we, we have to be anchored in that. Let, let me uh, uh, try and uh, make a basic point, which uh, actually came up this morning in, in the keynote, especially uh, actually Pierre Olivier's question about the upper triangle, which is how, do, how does the kind of thinking about the future affect today? Because in the end, we meet eight times a year, roughly every six weeks. And what we have to do is to say, okay, all of these questions about the future, how are they affecting decision making today? Are we seeing it in the behavior of firms? Are we seeing it in the behavior of, of uh, households, of investors? And so I think the mapping from these medium term uh, trends, whether it's deglobalization, uh, climate change, uh, the rise of AI, all of which I presume will have a bigger effect in the future than they do today. You have to solve backwards. And there's many possible scenarios. And of course, we, we like to run scenarios. But in the end, I'm going to emphasize it is what it means is, uh, I think uh, you have to put a big premium on, on uh, diagnostics, uh, to coin a phrase, being data dependent. Uh, and you have to say, OK, are the data moving in a direction where it's becoming clear for example, that, that European firms uh, are, are uh, e either uh, reshoring, as one example, against the, the kind of uh, deglobalization risk, or even maybe for the demographic reason that Olivier just mentioned, are they essentially maintaining plans to invest around the world? given the shrinking labor force, the expected shrinking of the European labor force. So, so there's lots of uh, ways to map these uh, medium-term uh, issues into how to think about the data, the data inflow. Uh, another way of saying this is uh, we like to do trend cycle decompositions. But in doing that trend cycle decomposition, you have to allow for the fact that the trend is moving. It's not some kind of stable world. Uh, so this morning, when I was just trying to think about this panel, uh, I, I recalled uh, Mervyn King's uh, uh, description of the Great Moderation, which is basically the nice period, non-inflationary continuous expansion, nice. And in fact, uh, a few weeks ago, uh, Ben Broadbent, in, in his final speech, I think, at the Bank of England, uh, said we're, we're going to be in the, in the nasty de decade, uh, which is basically uh, no longer stable uh, uh, trend. So Nazis, uh, these are years where we're not going to have stability. And this makes the basic diagnostic issue uh, difficult 
what element is pure cycle, what element, and of course, in a Bayesian sense, you have to put kind of weights on, on each possibility. Um, and in turn, uh, that goes to uh, policy making. How do you make policy making when you're not sure exactly how to read the data and what kind of robust uh, policy making uh, uh, would, would, would make sense? Uh, let me um, uh, also maybe uh, mention, and Olivia, I think, I think gave a good account there, it is that, and you know, I'm looking at a research audience, it's really important that, that we do have research contributions which really make clear individual mechanisms, saying, you know, I've taken on this issue, I've put it into a particular framework, here's what's going to happen. But the reality is, uh, 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 for policymakers, we have to aggregate across all of those papers, because it, it, um, uh, in relation, for example, to, to demography, I've come across people who have very strong beliefs, and they say, okay, why do you believe that? And they will spell out some mechanism. And then say, okay, well, how about the, that guy over there who's got a very strong, very well articulated uh, exposition of another mechanism moving into the other direction? So I, I would say, uh, it, it, you know, uh, and th this is, I suppose, the maybe beauty of macroeconomics it, is that, um, uh, uh, and general equilibrium for that matter, you, you do have to think um, in, in a very broad way. And where does that get me? It gets me to essentially being uh, fairly uh, non-committal. So I don't think you're going to hear me uh, being being very committed, saying I know for sure that the future is going to have uh, either faster growth rates or lower growth rates. I know for sure that the future is going to have um, a greater risk aversion or less risk aversion and so on. Uh, and I think coming back to, to the more kind of uh, narrow kind of uh, perspective of a central bank where essentially uh, I don't, uh, focus on the next few weeks as opposed to the next few years, um, it, it really is um, trying to solve backwards from these medium term issues uh, uh, to, to, to the near term. Uh, and maybe I'll stop there. Thank you, Philip. Um, I'll have some questions on this. I'll come back to that. But let me first go to Monica. Thank you very much. I, uh, when Pierre Olivier sent the email about uh, getting ready for this panel, I uh, thought I, need, I also need to think about two issues that worry me going forward and that policy needs to think about. And the first is actually I have in common with Olivier, uh, the aging uh, population, which is for me new, I never worried about it. Uh, I always thought this is an easy problem to, to fix. Uh, you have tons of people, young people who are willing to migrate in other countries and they will come in and replace uh, those low fertility rates that we have in many industrialized countries. So, I, so it's a topic that I never worried about. Uh, you see the masses that want to immigrate to the to the U.S., to, to Europe. Uh, so I, it, this seems like, from an economist's point of view, an easy problem to fix. Um, and then we see a rise in political parties whose unique focus it is uh, to stop immigration. Uh, and then you wonder whether the migration that you think is going to happen will actually happen. And that, that made me worried. And now, now I think maybe we do live in a reality that going forward is going to have uh, low interest rates and low R stars. And so central banks will have to think about uh, this new environment going forward. Uh, the second uh, is climate change, uh, which is a topic that is going to require large redistributions of capital across firms. Uh, so, so in order to address this issue, uh, some both within sectors as well as across sectors, we're going to see um, firms shrink and other firms expand. Otherwise, this, the adjustment won't happen. Uh, and so typically, when you need large redistributions of capital, you need uh, for firms that grow to have a low cost of capital, uh, because otherwise they're not able to relatively acquire more capital than other firms. Uh, and here, actually, central banks play an important role uh, in this, because many of the uh, policies that they conduct uh, are not neutral in terms of 
uh, redistributing capital to cleaner firms or, or, or more dirty firms. Uh, and I applaud actually the ECB uh, in, uh, and many Asian central banks uh, that there is thinking about this issue. What's the carbon footprint of some of the policies that the ECB is conducting? Uh, I worry, I think, as much as Olivier about central bank independence uh, in this. Uh, just thinking about the problem uh, may uh, create political pressure later on when the, the uh, populism is going to arrive. Um, but I believe uh, in, in some of these policies, they're actually counterproductive. So they are if you look at the ratio of emissions to GDP, uh, they will increase this emission intensity in which we're producing GDP. Uh, and so I think it's very important to think about, for example, in corporate purchase programs, which bonds do you purchase? Because if you do policies that purchase bank or bonds of firms uh, that, are, that have issued many bonds, which is the historical policy, was the historical policy of the ECB, you end up uh, buying bonds of firms that have a lot of capital. And these firms, um, tangible capital, uh, these firms have uh, high emissions. Uh, and so you end up subsidizing uh, firms that have, um, that will increase your the aggregate emission intensity. Uh, and that is also true for other types of policies, like just interest rate policy. Uh, you can look at the distributional consequences of that. And I, I'm not saying you want to be green in terms of your monetary policy. What, but what I want to say is you want to be aware that you're not, want, you're not brown. So let's try to be emission neutral in some sense uh, with a monetary policy that, that is being conducted. The other... Uh, some, uh, especially in the U.S., have decided that climate change is not an issue, uh, but financial markets are acutely aware of uh, the risks that are associated with uh, climate risk. So whether or not we acknowledge it, it's there and it's being priced. And you see it the most clearly in the insurance markets. Uh, for example, in California, it's now very difficult in many areas of California to get any kind of home ownership insurance uh, because insurance companies have reacted to the increased uh, fire risk. Uh, and so that's already being priced. Uh, and so there's no way of denying it because households face this risk uh, or these prices directly. And the same is true for companies that uh, have, have uh, production ways of producing with high emissions, uh, they perceive higher cost of capital. Uh, there's clear evidence that in CEO um, that in board calls, uh, CEOs mention higher costs of capital, uh, especially when they are running a company that have, uh, has high emissions. And so they are aware of uh, the fact that it's being priced, that investors are looking at uh, emission intensities. Uh, and so whether or not we want to acknowledge it, this is a risk uh, that currently is being priced. And so I think central banks uh, need to think about these risks, uh, even if there is an electorate out there who that a large part of it chooses to ignore them. Um, the other feature, and it's related to the first issue of the aging population, that you would uh, think that happens with climate change is large migration moves. That's the other way you're going to have large redistributions within uh, the firm sectors. Uh, and across firm sectors, but also uh, of households. Because if households move, uh, households who happen to have uh, homes or, or land, who own land in desirable locations, uh, they're going to benefit. And so they will, there's going to be a large redistribution of capital across households. And so that's another uh, way uh, we have to think about uh, the future. And I, this is not something that necessarily central banks can address, but there will be redistribution of of, uh, of capital for households as well. The, the final uh, direction in which central banks will have to hopefully matter is in the supply of assets. Uh, so many cons households are worried about so-called green assets because a lot of it, there's a lot of greenwashing and central banks can uh, have play a key role in making sure that what's called green is actually green by just providing information, making sure that the standards that are being applied are solid information about emission intensities of firms, 
It's clear that not everything can be done through debt. Many green com or clean companies uh, are equity financed. And so it, to the extent that you need equity finance, uh, the ECB should be thinking about public-private col collaborations for venture capital in Europe because you can't finance a green revolution uh, with debt only, uh, even though it's great to think about initiatives that change bank regulation in a way that would favor uh, clean technologies and also clean home owner uh, homeowners will have to do their part they need to, there has to be a green retrofitting of homes uh, and again that's a whole loan portfolio uh, that can be regulated by central banks but again i'm wor as worried about uh, central bank independence as everybody else thanks Thank you, Monica. So maybe now um, let me open it up to the panelists in case they want to react to each other's. Uh, Philip, uh, I see you raise your hand first. Well, it's probably useful effort for me to uh, explain a little bit about the, the work on climate change at the ECB uh, because it has come up. Uh, and uh, let me also acknowledge, I mean, Monica's work. Uh, on the corporate bond portfolio uh, was was very helpful uh, for us. So I I think um, we we are very uh, mindful of the mandate that we have, which is embedded in the European Treaty, and which is basically hand in hand with the independence that the ECB has. So uh, everything we we are doing, whether on the supervisory side or on the monetary policy side, is our interpretation of the narrow mandate that we have, which the primary mandate being price stability, uh, but also the secondary mandate, which is to support the general eco economic policies of the European Union. So clearly in Europe, it's different to, to the, uh, some other parts of the world in terms of the uh, very extensive program of, of kind of a pro-transition, if you like, economic policies at the European Union level including re relating to what Monica just referred to in terms of information now. Uh, there's a lot upcoming in terms of information disclosures and so on. So uh, essentially, uh, one big driving force, uh, both on the supervisory side, but also in terms of how we run our programs, is risk management. And uh, climate change is a kind of trend factor. You can't go back and look at some data set saying, that data set gives you the complete history of every possible eventuality for climate change. It's, it's a, obviously an upwardly trending uh, global warming situation. Uh, but but it, it does mean um, when we think about whether an asset purchase program, a lending program, uh, the collateral pool and so on, uh, we do have to take into account risks, even uh, tailed risks or hard to quantify risks. So, so I do think um, uh, we're trying hard to, to explain that everything we do is, is, is very much uh, within the mandate. It's very much in line with our independent role. But then also maybe connecting to, to something Monica just said, you have also heard, I mean, for many years, but it's been uh, increasingly uh, in intensity more recently saying, look, uh, Europe really, uh, it's going to be very difficult to deliver everything that needs to be delivered without capital markets union. And capital market union has a debt side in terms of uh, increasing uh, the role of non-bank debt, uh, but also has an equity side, making it easier uh, to, to, to kind of um, uh, finance equity. And maybe I'll make the connection to what Olivia said about uh, pay-as-you-go systems and moving to more kind of, uh, uh, if you like, accumulation-based systems. Uh, you need both because uh, uh, once you have a more... Uh, institutions and individuals who need to save for retirement through accumulation of assets, it's clear there's going to be, I think, a bigger demand for equity type assets because you, you need that for, you know, <laughs> if you have a 40 year horizon. So, so this huge opportunity here, may, maybe the timing is aligned, becoming aligned between demand for equity assets and supply of equity assets. And, and that's a big responsibility, I think, for the European uh, policymakers in general to take it on. But I think also, it's also clear uh, what we do is, uh, and of course, we're, we're a big institution, we're European wide, so it's very visible what we do. But there's a lot going on in terms of national fiscal policies. Uh, 
you know, retrofitting homes, supporting firms who, who want to move to greener technology. So if you like, in terms of the, we might be quite visible in terms of the overall uh, effort on, on the green transition, uh, there's plenty being done through, through national authorities and other arms of the European system. So maybe I'll stop there. Thank you. Olivier? I have three points. First, a, a footnote on, on Japan. Japan was able to solve partly the issue by having a large current account surplus, basically getting demand from the rest of the world because well, the rest of the world was different. If we all get in trouble, and that option is not there anymore. And what we may see is attempts to do it through depreciation, but it doesn't work uh, when everybody does it. And I think that's, again, a scenario we have to think about. Second point is immigration. Uh, despite what's happening in the US, I suspect that the US is fundamentally different from Europe and Asia in that respect, that it can accommodate, it has accommodated immigration much better and so I think this is something that is going to make a difference to growth rates for quite a while. The, the last point is, I was looking for something to disagree with. Uh, I have found it, um, which is on monetary policy and other considerations than just, uh, 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 just inflation. So what I've argued is that the central bank should pay attention to distributional implications. For example, if you tighten monetary policy and it affects primarily credit to household, it's not the same as it primarily it affects stock prices. These are different people, different uh, distributional implications. Given the politics, it seems to me that's extremely relevant. Now, should it do something to global warming in the way it has been discussed by Monica and Philip? I'm skeptical because, again, I think it threatens independence. And I think that the central banks can only do things at the margin. Relative to the distributional effects I talked about, I think these are much smaller than what the government of the private sector can do. So I double down. We should pay attention to distributional implications of monetary policy, but not try to get into uh, uh, other uh, ways of uh, intervening. Anika. Great. Great. Uh, the, I, I think, again, the, I'm not arguing for policies that would take central banks away from their mandates, uh, but I do think that in the past, um, central banks have conducted policies that were counterproductive. So they, if you go in the wrong directions with your policy, you're, you're not uh, actively um, supposed to stop good change from happening. And that's how I interpret, uh, how, how that's how we studied the, the European bond purchase program in the past. And that's how it was designed to be, is what it was making the economy dirtier. Uh, and so I, I, I'm not saying uh, this is the, your, the central bank should be the green lender in the economy. That's not what I'm saying, because that would clearly not be the mandate. But there are ways of I implementing policies that can have unexpected effects, uh, and those will affect emissions because that's not what we typically study is uh, emissions. Uh, economists have studied emissions only re more recently. This has become more in the focus because of climate change. And I feel we can be do smarter, we can be smarter about these policies uh, and design them in a way that they don't have unintended consequences for, uh, for emissions. I, I also think that we're doing a bad job um, as economists more generally in explaining our positions because it's very easy to um, to label us as pro-migration people or uh, pro, inter, you know, uh, we have an independent organization and it's easy to brand us as advocating for policies that are not in the mandate, uh, while what we're actually doing is discuss how to sensibly have migration and how to sensibly have monetary policy that doesn't go in the wrong direction. So if I if I may come, uh, come in on this, I mean, it, it seems to me that the... Um, uh, I mean, central banks are very fond of separation principles, uh, trying to keep different instruments for different targets. If we lived in a world in which we could uh, politically implement um, global carbon price, 
in a sense, we know with the economists would say this is uh, this is the way you would deal with uh, the climate transition. And once you've done that, you effectively have a separation principle. You could have your central banks focused on price stability and not have a portfolio mandate because this is all internalized with. So obviously we're not in that world, and, and so we're, that separation principle doesn't apply. And I think I, I hear what, what you're saying, Monica, is well, in that world we, we, we kind of have to use the instruments we have. And then there is, in the background, there is a, a, a sort of political economy constraint. We have to be careful about how much we do in that space because at some point it could come and, and, and be uh, uh, misrepresented or misperceived. Um, is, that, is that fair? Um. No, I, th I think about the one thing that I'm clear of is that the policies should not be conducted in a way that it gets worse. That's all I'm saying. The, the, there are ways of being climate neutral in your policies that at least that is what we should be achieving. Whether we want to have, whether it's welfare uh, beneficial to have policies that are greener than neutral, uh, in terms of emissions is is that's debatable because that's exactly where political uncertainty comes in is uh, are you doing something that is so costly for central banks and we can talk about other policies that have widened uh, the balance sheet of central banks with which have introduced risks for central banks independence it's not just the green policies but QE in general has endangered uh, central banks and we still did it because uh, why because there have been situations where QE has proven itself a great tool uh, to uh, have economic stability, and central banks have done a great job in using QEs to calm down markets uh, where calmness was needed. Okay. So let me maybe ask a question to both Olivier and, and, and Phil, and then uh, uh, after that we can open it up for questions from, from the floor. Uh, to Olivier, I, I mean, you... Um, restricted your remarks, you said at the opening, on monetary policy. But I, I, I want to kind of push you a little bit, because a lot of the issues you talked about, whether it's distributional, whether it's uh, populism, uh, whether it's uh, uh, protectionism, uh, touch, touch on fiscal. And, and, and let me phrase it in the following way. Uh, we're, we can interpret part of the rise of the support for populist platforms as, um, to some extent, uh, some form of demand for more protection uh, that can take the form of fiscal transfers. It doesn't have to, as you said, it could be about anti-immigration or things like that, which are other forms of protection, uh, but not through necessarily spending. Uh, and so the question I guess I have for you is on the fiscal side, how do you how do you think about the challenges that um, authorities would face given we start with an elevated debt position, we start with overall growth that's going to be low maybe for demographic and aging reasons, maybe for other reasons, productivity growth. Um, we currently have interest rates that are high. Now you argue that they might be coming down, but right now they are, they are real rates are, are high. Um, and, and there are the spending needs that we talked about, whether it's climate or, uh, or other cli uh, spending needs. And, and so how would you think about uh, uh, fiscal authorities, not just monetary, would, would navigate this? Um, for Phil, uh, I was struck by what you said about uh, the role of models and data dependence um, and how we should be running the scenarios, which I fully agree with, but they can be very different. We don't really know how things are going to play out, whether we think about AI or we think about some, some other, you know, fragmentation or other things, uh, reshoring. And you ended by saying, I want to be a little bit prudent and I don't want to be jumping too quickly. So does that mean, I mean, I, you know, in a sense, what I hear you saying is we want to have some sort of robust risk management approach to monetary policy. And we want to, to jump in one direction once we're pretty sure that this is the direction of travel. Does that mean that structurally central banks will have to be behind the curve? Good. Um, this would take a while. But um, let me give you the, the highlights. Um, the way I think about it is real rates are still fairly close to growth rates. So the burden of debt, the fiscal burden of debt is not very high. There is clearly risk, but it is not a major issue. Uh, having a high level of 
that to GDP, Japan being, again, the, the example. This being said, I think what has to be avoided on both political and uh, economic grounds is an explosion of that. And so what I've been arguing for in the context of France, but in, in general, is that the primary deficit has to be reduced to zero. Now, what we understand is it, can it cannot be done overnight. Uh, and the question is, can it be partly financed by debt? But anything which is increased protection is going to be there forever, should not be financed by debt. Anything which is a push and then will do less, such as investment in green stuff or defense, can be justified. But I think when it comes to protection, uh, there is not a whole lot of room. And uh, at least in the country from where we come, I don't think there is much room for increasing it through financial means. This doesn't say that there are not other ways of doing good things. But financially, I don't think that there is much room. So I, I think uh, your question is helpful because it gives, gives me an opportunity to explain a little bit about, uh, I think, how, how we try and proceed. So in, ter in terms of scenarios, I think it's important basically to have a, to have a matrix. So um, if, if you think about the, the kind of uh, columns in that matrix, you might have a baseline in the middle, and then on either side of that baseline, you could have what happens if something is better or worse than expected. So there's a fairly natural three way to organize anything. <laughs> but I think it's a problem if you only have one row in that matrix. So you just say, well, what happens if I'm super concerned about something? So, okay, uh, that's nice, but I can think of another row in that matrix where there's another dimension of uncertainty. And of course you can't do everything, but having, if you like a reasonably sized matrix uh, is important. And then you can calculate, if you like, you know, under different policies, what kind of loss might you expect? And then uh, the question is, can you find a, a dominant strategy which basically minimizes regret across all of the different scenarios? Um, so, so I think uh, the discipline, by the way, of everyone who works on uh, policy making under uncertainty, different ways to make decisions, uh, and so on, all of that, I, I think, is helpful. So I think the point I was trying to make is, Look at the whole matrix. Don't just look at you know one cell, uh, because. Um, but then, then the the other part of your question is, okay. Uh, I don't know if you've thought of everything, but more or less that there is a kind of a, a, a two dimensional answer. So, in relation to uncertainty about the strength of monetary policy transmission, because you know we haven't done all that many tightening cycles, the financial system's always undergoing structural change. Um, and also in terms of the condition of the real economy, there is, and we, we do say it's one of our three criteria is, you know, how strong is monetary transmission? I think uh, in a lot of setups, that uncertainty means you should go, go more gradually. On the other hand, I think it's fairly robust, which is if, you're if the uncertainty is about how persistent is the inflation process, Waiting and seeing and letting that persistence lock in is, is a problem. So under that scenario, you go more quickly. So even that, there isn't a universal answer between uh, when do you go more slowly, when do you go more quickly? Uh, and then I, I do think uh, in terms of uh, it's not only about the first decision. Uh, there's also, if you like, it's, it's, um, uh, there are some uh, strategies where you basically say, OK, I'm going to wait but conditional and when I actually crystallize, actually I need to respond, then you move quickly in order to make up for, for the kind of initial uh, delay in, in kind of making your assessment. So, so I mean, of course, this episode, um, there's lots more will be written about optimal policy making under this episode and future episodes, uh, but, but that's some of the uh, issues. Let me just jump in a little bit on distribution. Uh, yesterday morning when I opened, I kind of explained all the different work at the ECB looking at heterogeneity. It's very important in, in connection to the keynote this morning, even for understanding the aggregates to understand the distribution. That, that, that matters quite a bit. But it's also helpful for how we explain and articulate our, our, our policy. But maybe uh, if Olivia has a chance, have we thought about it, is what I do have a question about is, what is the balance in these big distributional forces 
between the trend decline in the equilibrium real interest rate versus monetary policy. And what's interesting now uh, for the ECB is, of course, before 2021-22, uh, we had a long time of loosening policy. And there's many criticism, okay, this has distribution effects. Now, if you like, uh, we've done the full cycle. We loosened for a long time. Now we've been tightening. And of course, over the full cycle, the cyclical element of interest rate policy, uh, there's two sides to that. And the question is, on average, what is the distributional impact versus, uh, as I say, the fact that uh, low equilibrium or star basically means higher asset values, you know, including house prices and, and other elements. So, so it's that balance, um, you know, I, I think is maybe interesting. Okay, we have a few minutes left, so let me open it up and maybe take a few questions from the audience or panelists. Um, so I'll ask a question. Olivier knows where this is coming from, I think. And um, so one aspect that I think you guys have not touched on is financial regulation. And I think I'll, I'll try to be agnostic on what happened a few months ago. Some people see the episode in Switzerland and the U.S. says, oh, the reforms post-GFC really worked. We didn't have another Lehman. Others would say we were lucky and look at what central banks had to do to avoid another Lehman. If you start, if you look at the language at the beginning of the Dodd-Frank Act, is exactly designed to avoid what the Fed had to do to prevent SVB to becoming worse. So how do you see going forward the need for much tighter financial regulation relative to what we have today? And I think this actually interacts with populism. If you do the parallel with the 20s and the 30s and, and what happened at that time, you see that they you know, unbridled financial markets contributed to the populist push at that time. So I'll leave it there. Let me see if there is any other questions so we can group them. Let's see uh, any hand. So maybe we start with Olivier, but maybe Monica, you'll want to weigh in on this. Uh, I think the if you look at, uh, we computed risk exposures of mid-sized banks in the U.S. currently through derivatives. And so currently, there you see mid-sized banks exposing themselves a lot through derivatives to, in to interest rate risk, which means that we just had an episode where mid-sized banks, which were regulated less recently, um, had their balance sheet deteriorate and then because of interest rates moving uh, and going bust, um, like, Silicon Valley Bank. Uh, and now, if you look currently at the current data, it's, it, it, they're doing funky things through derivatives, uh, assuming exposures. So I would say in the US, clearly mid-sized banks are not regulated enough. So there's one strong, very strong conviction that I have. The, the regulations were loosened because uh, it was uh, felt that stress testing them was too expensive for small and mid-sized banks. Uh, and now we see they're, they have, we, we've had failures and now they're taking on huge risk exposures. In terms of overall uh, the risks that we need to regulate, is there, there has been in the academic literature this notion that banks are fully hedged uh, against interest rate risk because they are, while they're making risky loans, they have deposits that uh, allow themselves to finance themselves cheaper in times when interest rates are, are higher. Uh, and this notion just, uh, it, I, I have the impression we have now seen that this is not, uh, they're not fully hedged. There's interest rate risk in banking, and we need to go back to think about how to regulate the interest rate risk in banking. Do you have anything to say on this? Well, uh, I think the question is probably more about the US. But, but uh, what I would say is, um, obviously here at the uh, SSM, you know, we have over 100 banks. So the scope of the number of banks which are intensively supervised is, you know, probably uh, quite high in Europe compared to some other jurisdictions. Um, 
But maybe my, my, my two comments are, number one it is, uh, I think you've articulated, uh, which is probably not at the centre of the current debate about some regulations, which is what is the social optimum or the socio-political optimum as opposed to what the banking lobby uh, might, might say. Uh, and then the other one, which is maybe uh, to, to say that clearly, and we've been identifying this for a long time, uh, is of course that there's an asymmetry now where the banks have a lot of regulation, a lot of supervision, whereas non-bank financial intermediation, um, and again, thinking about where, where kind of uh, there might be uh, it, you know, poorly understood risk taking and exposures, uh, that, that is something that uh, is, is, is lurking. I mean, non-banks are not the same as banks. There's a fundamentally different role. But, but it, it is the case that, that the reallocation out of the banking system into non-banks is, is something where the, the full uh, risk exposure is not fully understood at this point.